Okay, everybody, please help me welcome back to the stage. Uh, Debbie Lynch. Can you guys work on here? Let's move over there for now and okay. answer the question and then we'll get them to finish these. Can you hear me now? Okay, you can hear me. <laughs> um, yeah, so I grew up on the west side of Cleveland in Rocky River, Ohio, um, since I was about five. And I started taking drawing lessons at the Beck Center in Lakewood when I was <laughs> um, a wonderful place when I was in the second grade. Um, we were doing a lot of figure drawing and still lives. And I was always the youngest one. My, mo my mom has to have credit for that because she forced me into those classes. I didn't want to go. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I went to school on the east side for a while as well. I was in the art program at Beaumont um, in Shaker Heights. Um, so, yeah, it's wonderful to be home. I think, did that answer your question? Yes, it did. <laughs> and for you, Debbie, I know that um, you've made other films about art, including The Price of Everything, which is a really great documentary. I tried to play it at SIF, I think it was last year or the year before. Um, look it up. I think it's released now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. HBO and you can get it. Yes, <laughs> okay. Um, so can you talk to us a little bit about your history in filmmaking mm -hmm. and specifically the art world? Yes. Okay. Okay. First of all, I just want to give Gisela a huge thank you because she's so unbelievably in demand and busy right now. And she drove here from Detroit via Boston and a residency in Miami and a sold out show in London. And thank you. So my background's actually in marketing and branding, but I've been very involved in the art world probably for 30 years. My mother's an architect and I sort of was grown up, growing up, the way I learned about the world was sort of through the prism of art and design and it's just always been an important part of my life. And I wanted to make a film when we made The Price of Everything. It wasn't so much about film as I really wanted to make a film that pulled back the curtain on the art world because I think that art matters and there was a lot of noise about the market and the you know, elitism and blah, blah, blah. And I always felt that there was also things like the Front Triennial announcing that they're giving three $25,000 scholarships and there's programs you know, all over the country. Um, Aggie Gund, what she does in New York with studio and a school. So you sort of hear about the icky side, but you didn't hear about the wonderful things and the fact that even though we don't have a lot of federal and state support for the arts, we have incredible philanthropy and we also have a lot of creativity. So that film ended up being sort of in the treetops. And when you make a movie, you end up with, in that instance, we had about 100 hours of unused footage. And when you're in the edit room, you kind of realize you can't be all things to all people. And what got left on the edit floor were sort of the emerging artists and the MFA programs. And sort of my wonder was like, why would anyone pursue a career in the arts 
if even when you have a terminal degree from a place like Yale or CalArts or the Institute, the Art Institute of Chicago, the chances of making it, whatever that may be, are less than 5%. So it sort of emanated from that. But then we were very fortunate to get Gisela and Felipe and Chris and Jenna and Hildy and Simcoe and you know all of them kind of signed on before the pandemic. Um, which I think is also really interesting because so many of the issues that came out during the pandemic um, kind of to the forefront are really embedded in the work of these artists, which sort of to me just reinforces the whole idea of why art matters and we should look at it. But we kind of had to pivot and we really made a change, I think, a film about disruption and the need to rethink things and change. So, you know, as a filmmaker, and when you do a verite film, you're running around with a camera, and you're interviewing people, and you shape the story in the edit room, and you're kind of able to, I hate using the word pivot because it's so overused, but kind of pivot. Right. Um, and I, we were just talking about this outside of the theater, is like, we've all changed a lot. This was finished in September, but like the filming was done kind of six months before, like we were editing and filming. And the world's changed a lot, and it feels like we sort of captured the beginning of the end of one thing and maybe the beginning of something new. Well, I love the way that you end the film with the line that, you know, this is with Chris Klein, the beginning, this is the beginning of everything. And I think um, that's so telling. I love that you talked about what did happen for artists during the pandemic and how they could pivot, <laughs> that word again that we're all very used to. But my question for you too, Gisela, next is, what is that future? What is that everything? What kind of world do you hope for for artists in the future? Um, I think I just hope that it's a more accessible world that more people can enter um, I think there's a lot of boundaries that stop a lot of ta talented and beautiful, beautiful perspectives from being a part of conversations or even making it into a gallery or, because it's a con competitive world um, and it takes a lot of resources even to create work in the first place um, to be able to go to art school. Um, so yeah, I hope the world pays attention to all the different kinds of work and perspectives and that there's more the way we look at art could be different. The way we, you don't have to have an MFA or a BFA to be considered brilliant. Um, that can come from any space, so. I'm gonna take a second to see if there's any questions from the audience. I have plenty, I can go on. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so uh, Debbie, a question I have for you as well is, um, especially at the end of the film when, we, when they touch upon things turning more digital, augmented reality, uh, creating a gallery space anywhere in the world. Uh, you know, that's, that's a little controversial for some people in the art world, I think, too, is taking it out of that sort of holy space of the gallery. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? And also, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts about that, too, Gisela, is, is how you feel about art world turning into digital. So, um, <laughs> I'm gonna say something a little bold, which I don't know who's doing what out there, but I didn't really know much about any of this until two months ago, three months ago, and I've actually been very deep into it and you know, spent time, at, we were at South by Southwest a couple of weeks ago where we won an audience award, so Yay. please vote. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I met someone who had created a metaverse in 2007 and his own currency, and he was, he had some Zaha Hadid movie theater in the metaverse and wanted to program a virtual film festival, and I kind of at first was like, he's out of his mind. Mm. And then you start sort of looking at it, and you realize that maybe the NFTs and the metaverse and the tokenization of things and Web3 has more to do about community and like suppose, and I mean, we're actually looking at doing something with this film where we might give free tokens to everyone who's seen the film and we've been on a crazy tour and those tokens will be given for free and give you access to content and perhaps things that artists do in this film 
as a way of democratizing access and creating community and sort of sharing information and stories as opposed to like, let's ask Gisela to make an NFT and see how much we can sell for, which just feels like kind of fancy merch, as like reactive to something as opposed to like, um, a lot of museum directors talk about kind of getting out of the museum and breaking boundaries and how can you make it more accessible and sort of kick it off the pedestal. So I, I, I think that the long-term look at kind of the NFTs and what they represent is really more about that. Yeah, um, I think I agree. I um, was he very hesitant at first about NFTs because it was a lot of different information. There's all, you know, whether it's morally right with the uh, environmental um, questions it brings up as well. But with my work in particular, I'm really interested in kind of like circular economics of making sure that the people that I work with and my subject collaborators do get paid in the future for their voice. They are able to, they're included in, you know, if I'm gonna be successful, then they can also, they're gifting me stories, they're sharing parts of themselves. So um, I think it's only right for, that's where it makes sense to me an NFT, if I could attach it and have them paid for, get paid for um, with it. Kind of what you're saying with making it about community, making it about um, care, I think that makes sense. But otherwise, it's just a lot. It's, yeah. There's a lot of confusing information on it. I, I also think, though, even in terms of film and how film is consumed right now, um, we've had discussions with distributors where it's sort of like a dagger in your heart where you're like, wait a minute, they'll buy it for this, you lose all rights, we never can do anything, and it could go on a platform buried with a thousand things, and, you know, whether a million people see it or a hundred million or a thousand, we're all given the same amount, and no one who's worked on it is... Co like, it just... I think there's a lot of things that are being revisited that give agency to the creatives. And I'm very, very, very interested in that. And also, like Gisela was saying, it's sort of a way to document it and pay back. Right, and I think the pace of that moving very quickly in some ways can be scary um, without things being regulated. Uh, but I think that there's also a lot of opportunity there, too. Mm -hmm. And Gisela, you mentioned just now about, I mean, a lot of this is about ownership, too, right? And I, I love how much um, you consider ownership to your subjects of your art as well. Can you talk a little bit more about that and also how you uh, came to connect with Gina and start that project? Yeah. Um, so I guess ownership as far as the work goes. Um, when I'm working with friends and collaborators, they have full control over what I'm doing with the voice and what, I, what images I'm working from. Um, and they also get a one-of-one one print of their work, um, which is something that I have made an agreement with, with my gallery, because I, you know, in a, in a perfect world, they'd be able to just own the paintings. I'm really creating this work for us in my community. And as an artist, I need to survive, so of course it's gonna end up in the market. Um, but where my heart lies is really with my with the people I'm working with and my friends and the people who are helping me learn, so um, I think it's still something I'm figuring out. That's why I am intentionally holding on to the rights of the audio. Um, there's certain things that I'm exploring right now that are thinking in a circular sense. Even when I'm doing performances, when I have openings, I I'm prioritizing including the people that I'm making the work for because it is a celebratory practice more than anything, and I just want people to see themselves and feel beautiful, so. Um, and then as far as how I connected with Gina, it was through the Cleveland Foundation, um, which was really wonderful, and I think my work just really aligned with her story as well. So we had started that project a few summers ago, and I remember sitting in Lakewood Park with her, and we were just chatting, and we did interviews and photos and talked about what she wanted for the painting, um, which was, you know, she like, her favorite color was purple, and she wanted butterflies, and it was a very collaborate, it was a collaboration. It wasn't something I could have created just on my own. It took conversation, and it took, um, you know, asking somebody what they want, because the painting's not about me. It's about people 
everybody's seeing that work, and I think s putting something on a street that you know is going to be seen so much too, you have to be intentional about it being safe and and cared for. And again, the first my first want for the work is just to make sure Gina liked it, and I think that was successful. So. Um, another question I have is around trust. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's another theme to this film in some ways too, for new artists especially. It's such a scary world um, in so many ways. Uh, as a new and emerging artist, can you talk a little bit about trust and how you find people to trust uh, in this industry? Yeah, um, that is not always the easiest thing to navigate, and I think I got really lucky finding the right mentors at the right time. Um, one in particular, Diana Campbell, um, happens to be half Chamorro from Guam, so that was like somebody who really just wanted to see me succeed and um, wanted me to be safe in the art world, and I really did meet people early on who was like, who warned me that I needed to be protected, that w there were parts of this um, industry that are very predatory and like people want to take advantage of young artists so I was lucky to have guidance in those moments and Cesar was also a big part of that and is a really wonderful friend to me um, so I'm always calling hi him when I need advice to make a decision um, so yeah I just, I just have the right people looking out for me I also have my family here as well so <laughs> my grandma and mom and dad and and me. <laughs> yeah. So, hello. Um, yeah. And Debbie, my, my last question is uh, for you. I think um, it seems a little bit obvious to say that we should be supporting the work of new artists. Can you talk a little bit about why that is so important right now more than ever? Well, I, I always tell people if they care about art and artists, you should buy living artists. I think it's really important to, you know, some people are pursuing a certain type of collection and you want a certain piece, but I, I think we have a responsibility to do it. I think that I would say to our film team through the course of production when there was a lot going on in the world and people might say, well, does art matter? And I would say, like, imagine the world without art and artists. And um, I, I just think we have a responsibility. If we can afford to be supportive, we should be supportive. And if you, even showing up at art shows of students and, you know, MFA shows and BFA shows and things like spring break and just sort of show your presence and be there. Because I think, obviously, artists all would like to make a living so they're not having three jobs bartending to support their practice, but I, I think most artists are like Gisela, they just want the work seen and appreciated and, you know, I, I, I think artists are sort of in many ways like public servants and they're always called upon to do things for free and to show up for free and to donate work and, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> support them, yes. Yeah. All right, well thank you so much Gisela for the, is there a question? Oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't see you there, go ahead. Um, during the shelter in place, I read The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer, who's from the Dresden Dolls, and she talked, she was the first artist to do like, I think, a, hundred, I know, a certain large number GoFundMe campaign. And so, can you comment about getting funded by your fans or, you know, supporters? And like, how that relates, even the thing, you know, for the, your film, how that relates to other art forms, because you really focused on painting and fine art, but not necessarily things like glass blowing or music or things like that. So I can sort of, I hopefully answer this. I'm not, it, we didn't do something like GoFundMe. Um, I, I'm involved in the art world and was, we were able to fund the film through a combination of investment and donation, which is sort of typical for mission oriented films. Um, and I think, the question about how to fund artists who are doing atypical practices. I mean, from what I've heard, GoFundMe campaigns can be very successful, but they're also very labor intensive. Um, <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. Okay. Can go and then okay. Um, thank you. My question's for Gisela. Um, I, I know that um, 
through the process of making your art, you know, you and your, your subject collaborators um, find a lot of healing through, through that process of, um, you know, the dialogue and the co-creation. And um, there's just so many survivors in the world, you know, uh, myself included. I'm wondering um, if you've seen other ways that people can access that healing um, through, you know, art and dialogue, um, even if they're not able to, you know, be one of your subject collaborators. Yeah, I think um, for me, I found my process based on what I needed, and that was dialogue, and that, and you know, the drawing and the art came secondary, but was helpful as well. So I have had an experience where I used to have an open call on my website, and people would come there and just like write pages and like put their stories there, and I think it just um, speaks to the need to just get it out, kind of put it, set it down somewhere, because I think a lot of survivors, it's important to know that. You know, that wasn't your fault and to like physically remove it from your body. I also think um, people who aren't able, like of course I don't have time to paint every single person, um, but I would like to. And I think I've had a lot of moments of seeing people see my work in person and you can tell when they see themselves in it and they have a moment with it without, without even needing the audio, without needing the dialogue. And I have been speaking about my work differently lately because, again, it's something I think I need to protect and be really conscious of as it moves through the art world because it's not really made for that. And um, like I'm really making it for the moments that we see ourselves in. And it is celebratory and it is um, sh like putting someone in a position of power and making them beautiful. and. Um, if people can see my work and see themselves in it and have moments of healing, I think that's a success. And thank you for your question. Yeah, that's a great question. All right, well, thank you again, Gisela, for your art, for being here. Thank you, Debbie, for making this film. Thank you all for being here. There's another screening tomorrow as well. Tell everyone to come see it and fill out your ballots if you can, too.